Okay, guys. This is going to be a general overview of the draft moves that we made and where the team stands as of right now and what I think about the roster. Yesterday was a very good day. Actually, or to say the day before yesterday. <laughs> and this thing is moving at a breakneck speed. I loved what we did yesterday. The only reason I ever had any issue was when it came to Seth Curry. Seth Curry, his contract is just like a year longer than you would want it to be. Because remember, there was a report by Shams, and everything has come out now to where it's really credible, where this front office, this brass, and Del Moy, obviously, you know, he wrote a whole chronicle in the Houston Chronicle about James Harden. I believe it is a very credible whether either by trade if Houston ever gets off his laws and understands that he is 31, he's on 25, or in 2022 when Harden becomes a free agent. There is a reason that Harden did not choose that extension even though it would have paid him 50 million dollars. In Harden's mind, he knows that his flexibility comes when he is going to be an unrestricted free agent in 2022. There is no reason for him to sign an extension right now. In fact, he probably wishes his contract were expiring right now. He could even more force Houston's hand. But even though his contract has two years on it, if I were the Houston Rockets general manager, it's not about being uncomfortable. It's about the more time I waste the less valuable James Harden becomes. Because you hear a lot of people talking now, 2022, Harden's going to be 33! And I want to give a rebuttal of that for one second. Yes, he'll be 33, but it'll only cost cap space. And I know some people will say, well, did we just come off from Al Horford? Yeah, we came off from an unathletic center who couldn't protect the rim. So unless James Harden falls off the face of the fucking earth, in two years, I just don't see that happening. I don't see that happening. And so some people say, Jay's all going to take care of himself the same way the bar Jay takes care of himself. Doesn't necessarily have to. He's not high flying dunking, he's step backing and shooting threes. But don't get me wrong, I think that by age 36, it'll no longer be hardened. So you pretty much only have two to three years when you sign him a prime hardened. Just don't give him the fourth year then. Duh. Just don't give him year four. If you would sign that one to a two year contract, not only would it have been easier to move it out of the first round pick, it would have at least actually made sense. Like, <laughs> that's what this is all about. You just gotta pair your years. So you can still sign James Harden into a max contract. Just make it a two or three year contract and then you're good. You got Harden for his prime. You got him what you paid him for. That's all that means. And Dale Moy and the new cat guy from the Pacers, the Sixers are in a substantially better position than what they were in last offseason when they had nobody like that and they had the Korean Joe people who just had zero idea not only of the roster bit, but also how to work a decent contract. So we're in a better position salary-wise, guys, in terms of just people who know what they're doing. You know, Burge is right about that. I just think it's the exact opposite of our take. You know, we thought that, okay, management is management, but we want to see the product on the floor produce. We want to see it get better. We want to be able to not substitute in all netter when we think that matters. We think that that is something in a coach's control. When you see what's happening on the floor and you refuse to make an adjustment, that is under a coach's control. Analytic people be damned. It's like putting a relief pitcher out on the field and... The relief pitcher throws the ball in the middle of the play and saying, Oh, no, it's not his fault for throwing the ball in the middle of the play. It's the ball for the offensive guy with the bat batting it. That's kind of what Broach is saying here. 
And, and it's like, no, you're taught, don't throw the ball in the middle of the damn plate. Same thing here. Basic coaching suggests if a guy is struggling, if a guy's not finding a shot, if a guy is defensively compromised, take him out of the damn lineup. If I can't expect that from a quality coach in the association, then what is the purpose of hiring them to begin with? So yes, what happening upstairs, Rose is right, that's important, that's huge. But it was also huge to get a guy who can make a basic substitution. Analytic be damned or not, it's a reasonable expectation to make good substitutions. It's reasonable. And Doc has made good substitutions. Uh, and I could go into it that vivid. In fact, I will do that. I think that that Dumb and Nuggets series is important to understand. If that was a Joel Embiid in the Clippers, that series would have gone totally differently. He would have been able to put Joel Embiid on Nikola Jokic, and he would have been able to attack the perimeter better and say, Kawhi, just go on Jamal Murray, don't worry about help. We got Joe there. Or we got a defender there. They had undersized Montrell Harrell and Ebiak Zubik. They weren't going to go to anybody like that, let alone Nikola Jokic. So, so, by the way, let me pour a little Debbie down on the Clipper Nation right now. Let's say that the collapse doesn't happen you play the, the Lakers. You go from Nikola Jokic to Anthony Davis. You're going to go from a really, really good center to a super athletic and big center who could catch lobs, hit a jump shot. Hell isn't guarding Anthony Davis any better than he was guarding your kick. And the same thing with Zubar. So you were still outmatched in the paint. And the lack of ball handling with Paul George and with Kawhi Leonard exists regardless. It existed for you the whole year. It just so happened that the Denver Nuggets with the way their roster was constructed was uniquely in position to exploit those two positions. They had way better ball handlers and better scorers, and they had a better center. The, the Nuggets were built to beat the Clippers. You know how Elton Brand was talking about, oh, we're built to beat the Bucks, oh, we're built to beat the Bucks, oh, we're built to beat the Bucks. You know how he w was all about that? In this case here, and now, the Nuggets did not build their roster with the idea of beating the Clippers, don't get me wrong. They built it to win the rest, obviously. But they didn't go into it with this sort of central mission in mind. Their goal was obviously to win the Western Conference Championship, but the way they built their roster, by coincidence, not by design, because you don't do that. As a general manager, you should not be thinking, um, let's see, I should make moves to just beat one team. Forget the rest of the league, forget the rest of the conference, forget how it fits my guy. No, I want to beat one team. That's not how general managing works. you got to build your team, and you got to build your team to be able to contend. Now, if you get to a playoff series and you lose to that team, and you already have established that the core of your team is more than good enough to get to that place in the first place, then you can fill in holes to try to take away a Giannis, but not before. <laughs> and you definitely couldn't say that the moment that you let Jimmy Butler walk. It was a different team at that point. Ah. <laughs> Just... <sighs> But yeah, it was an accident, not by design, that the Nuggets could take advantage of the Clipper weaknesses. And the Lakers with Anthony Davis all the more so. The problem for the Clippers is that they just traded six first round draft picks for their wing set that doesn't have ball handling ability. And they traded one for Marquise Morris. Seriously. It this has been a history of the Clippers. Why are you trading for players that don't fix where you're weak? You really needed another stretch for? Come on now. So I do believe that Doc Rivers had a bad hand personnel-wise with against the Nuggets. And then once 
Michael Porter Jr. was coming in and hitting shots. An explosive rookie with size and length. There was just way too much size, way too much ball handling, and way too much dominance from the center position. And so what Doc tried to do to sort of elevate that, he wanted to take away Jokic's passing. Easier said than done. I would have tried to make Nikola Jokic a scorer instead. Instead of doubling on Jokic, because Jokic is such... He is an amazing passer that, you know, and they really did stay to it, which I wouldn't have. I would have, I would have liked to have seen, just try to play him straight up one-on-one and try to play good help team defense. And if you are going to double, just like with a Jerome B, double when Jokic put the ball on the floor. Double when a passing lane isn't available. You have to pick and choose your double teams. And when you do double, double hard, double fast, so that there's no chance or an opportunity for Jamal Murray to come up the corner and hit that three ball. I think they should have been a lot more selective with their double teams. I think they should have been a lot more deliberate with their double teams. And I also think that they should have been a little more picky about their double teams and instead just try covering their guys, covering Murray, covering Michael Porter Jr., Try to contain the other guys and make Jokic more of a scorer. That's what I would have done to try to stop the wizard that is Nikola Jokic. But quite frankly, I don't even think that the Clippers had the defensive personnel. Like what? If you play a Beverly, are you going to take Lou Williams out? Or, you know, you'll give up some size if you play Beverly and Lou Williams together. It, it was just a totally messed up after. Paul George is not a power forward. Kawhi Leonard is not a power forward. The Clippers just fucked themselves up. When they got Kawhi Leonard, they should have been like, Dude, we have a mantra of hell. We have a St. George Alexander. We don't need Paul George. You want to come here, you're coming here with our offense. It's constructed. Just, these players who... The GMs need to stop this. The players don't have control. I'm sorry, JJ. They have to sign the contract. And when you sign the contract, that's it. That's where the relationship ends. After that, as a general manager, I have to do my job for my roster. I can't be ruining an NBA title contender just because you want to play with your best friend. I can't be doing that. You're not a general manager. You're not here. You don't have this executive degrees. Stop it. You're a player, you should be focusing on hooping. And if that makes you upset, then well, too bad. Even LeBron learned that lesson eventually, as he ruined several franchises into the ground, getting all players who maybe could fit when he was there, but when he left, the organization were in shambles. So at least he knew. At least he learned. He learned that that wasn't the right way to go about it. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I, that did turn into a little dot with the bench after all. Just defending what happened with the Clippers, why I blame Kawhi Leonard for what occurred, why I think it's just what they did with Tyron Lewis, they're going to make a difference if that is. They are still as fucked. So anyway, well, let's turn back to what we did the, the other night. Tyrese Maxey. Man... I want to apologize to RB and DJ and our community because I wasn't really focused on Maxi, and the reason I wasn't focused on Maxi is because I did not think we were going to go for a pure freshman. Last two drafts, we went with Lily Sherman, a junior from Wichita. And then last year, obviously, we go with Matisse Feibel. The strategy appeared to be that the Sixers were more going for these veterans, if you will, these guys who had experience in college and could come play right away. And that's not a bad strategy in the mid-20s. In fact, I actually think it's perfect. The problem is when you go too extreme, like for example, the other of Joe Palmer. So we'll talk about that later. Maury probably came in and said, you know, you're right, he's a likable guy. 
but not at 21. That's not where the value is. That's not where he's going to be slotted among other boards. And, and that's where their Moy is something that is much needed. It was needed to have a guy in that organization who understood the player value. We think that it's heartless, etc. No. If we had drafted Isaiah Joe number 21, we would have missed out on all the guards on the board. It would have been a disaster. I would have taken this very expensive map book and I would have thrown it to the ground. How do we pick Isaiah Joe number 21? But I did not think that we were going to go for a pure freshman. Ah, that's why we were so on Tyro Terry and Desmond Bain. Both of them, and I feel like... I mean, it doesn't matter now, they're both on different teams, but Bain and Terry were pretty close on my board. You were going to get the same thing. I don't think people kind of understood that Bain is a really good ball handler. He just gives you an extra inch, inch and a half, and it can defend more ones and twos. Then a Terry can, who will probably strictly only go ones at the next level. But we like both of those guys, and I like both of those guys, not only for the fit, but because I thought that it fit more the mold of what you were wanting, what you were wanting to go get, and what you really needed in the draft. So that's why that happened, and that's why I did not focus as much on a maxi. I really only watched his clips in detail once. So I go back after we draft him, after the draft, when it was all over, late last night, and into yesterday, I was watching Maxie's tape. And oh my fucking God. This kid is a stud. He is a flat out stud. So let's talk a little bit about Maxie. And we will talk about his tape later on. But I'll just give a couple of little snippets of what I saw. Tyrese Maxey has a lot of the same attributes that Halliburton does. Remember when I was saying 0.5% chance if Halliburton fell, I would be super ecstatic? And I gave my reasons why on the uh, chat there, where I said that Halliburton is an incredible playmaker. He is someone who can throw all the passes, and because he's a spot-up shooter, that means that you compare him with Joel Embiid and you compare him with Ben Simmons to get a shooter and a playmaker. So, let's put all that in context. Tyrese Maxey. There are a couple of advantages that Tyrese Maxey has over Halliburton that would have made me concerned. In fact, realistically speaking, Halliburton should have been the one to 21 and Maxey picked out 11. Because Maxey has certain strengths that I value a lot more. Maxi has a higher verticality. I am positive about that. I have never seen a 6 5 player play underneath the rim, and Holly Burden is an extremely below the rim player. Extremely below the rim. Like, he's not going to finish on the top of the trees. And then there was the added strength issue as well for Holly Burden. Maxi isn't the strongest guy himself, needs to put on the weight, needs to. When I say weight, don't worry. I mean core muscle strength, guys. Weight doesn't always mean it's going to be some fat balloon. Maxie's just going to put on muscle, core muscle, so he'll be able to take contact even better. He only takes contact pretty well. Just imagine him with 10, 15 pounds of muscle with NBA trainers. This kid could, he could win that starting job this rookie year. Now, I know it's not a normal rookie year. But it still is a month before your first preseason or whatever, first couple of games. So there's still time to get in the weight room. There's still time. Maybe not 15 pounds, but can you put on five? Reasonable. You can put on some five pounds of muscle, get a little bit stronger, get his core strength up. And he could be an elite finisher at the rim. In fact, one of the unique things that I did not know, and the link is going to be in the description to an ESPN interview, is that Tyrese Maxey is a master of using the glass. Knows all of the angles of the glass. And I did not know that the 360 reverse layup was called the Alex English. I thought Dr. Julius Irving and Michael Jordan painted in it, but whatever. 
The point is, he has an elite layup finishing tool. He also has a very good hang dribble. And he has a good, couple of good crossovers. But he doesn't yet have that four seamer. I want Maxi to play faster, ironically. In the NBA, I want him to play faster. I want him to use his explosiveness more. He apparently had an injury in high school. It's all healed up now. And so, maybe in this rookie year, he's going to be even more explosive than he was at Kentucky. I want him to be able to go north to south quicker. Because I'm going to give you guys a comparison. And I think that most of you probably haven't seen it. And that's because, unfortunately, his career was... He cut it short with his own stupid decisions. Gilbert Arenas, a.k.a. Agent Zero, for people who grew up in my generation, 28 years old, Tyrese Maxey could be Gilbert Arenas. And if you don't know who that is, go look up some of the highlights real quick. Because, like, seriously, I even looked on basketball with French. Gilbert Arenas, 6 v 190. Tyrese Maxey, 6 v 170 ish. And you look at the tape and you're like, oh my god, did we just go and get ourselves to give it arenas? Did we just go and get ourselves a guard of the future? And then when you consider that his mentality, his effort, his defense, and how he has a good head on his shoulder, guys, this could be what we were waiting for. Just like with Shake Newton, something good happened in his franchise that had no business happening. If Maxi fulfills my Gilbert Arenas comparison, you pair a Gilbert Arenas type guard with Shake Milton, and your backcourt is set for life. We don't even have to chase James Harden anymore. We don't have to chase. We don't have to chase Buddy Heald anymore. We can just wait and let those two young kids grow into a dynamic backcourt. Now, that may not be necessarily fair on Maxi, but check this out on Gilbert Arenas' rookie year. He averaged... 10 points, 4 rebounds, 3 assists in the NBA on 25 minutes. Is that reasonable for Ricky in today's inflated pace? Yeah. So I think that Maxi could come in, whether it's off the best of the six man or as a starter. It is a fucking steal. And so the job four played out perfectly for us. Where a guy like Maxi did fall, but our other guys, Tyler Terry and Bain, were there. I would have loved to have traded up in the draft. I would have loved to have gotten, now that I know a Maxi, he's more of a combo guard. Maybe I get a Tyler Terry to come off my bench. Or maybe I see if Desmond Bain could be my small forward. Because we're small, small forward now, guys. Josh Richardson wasn't really a small forward per se, but at least he could look the part. And now you don't have that. And I think that's what you're going to see at the agency. You know, 4 for 4 Philly fans, shout out to him. He had a bunch of free agents, Daniel, going on. Look out for that. Because the Sixers do not have a small four right now. Like, literally, we're probably going to be playing a couple of guards. I would play Ben Simmons as a small forward. But seriously, if Doc Rivers is still saying that Ben Simmons is going to be your point guard... Then one of the guards, Shake or Maxi, is going to come off your bench. Danny Green not starting. Come on. Uh, uh, that year, a uh, horrible. He's just going to be a guy on the bench. He's going to be an eight man. He's going to be a locker room guy. He's going to talk about Kawhi. He's going to talk about LeBron. He's going to be a positive veteran here. But he's not winning that job. That wing spot is not being won by Danny Green. Probably not being won by Terrence Ferguson either. But it's definitely not being won by Danny Green, guys. Uh, that's what this free agency is about. He's going to try and fill in that wing spot. That wing hole. At least for a short term. Before going after the hard in the build, etc. Although I believe that by game 25, Doc Rivers will be like, eh, Ben really isn't a full time one. We'll move Ben Simmons to the small forward. Instantly straight the small forward and then develop your young backcourt. That's what I think is going to happen over the long period of time here in terms of that situation. But the overall gist of it, and we're going to show a video later, Tyrese Maxey at number 21, I think that he may very well end up developing to be better than Holly Burden. And check this out, I think he could be better than a mellow ball at the end of the day. Like, three years, four years, as Maxi becomes a legitimate free agent, we could be looking at a situation where he is our star hunter. 
Yeah, Dan Moy was still looking for stars, and Maxi was one of those guys. So, then we have to look to the Josh Richardson trade because we essentially traded our other high second round pick along with Josh Richardson to bring in Seth Curry. Seth Curry, the basketball player, they might start him. They might. It depends. Are they going to get a wing? Will they be able to get a wing? If they're able to get a wing, then Seth Curry is also going to come off the bench. The bench, by the way, is going to look out a lot better. Maxi. Green, Ferguson, Curry. That bench now all of a sudden actually has some capable guards. To the point where we may not be signing on a convert guard. We're already kind of getting loaded on guards. What a fuck! What a noble concept! <laughs> DJ and I agree on this. What a noble concept! Give them 6 one 6 feet normal dudes who can handle a basketball. What a noble concept! And now the Sixers are loaded there and a little weak on wingmen. So I expect them to continue to look for a size on the perimeter. When I said size, a lot of guys were overreacting. And they don't realize we're a totally different team. Our offense is going pound his weight. We don't even have a backup center. Guys, actually, I think Paul V can develop into that. And maybe this year is about playing a young guy, which... Yay! I would love to see that little youth moving off the bench. But... If the idea is to still contend for a champion, I think that they could possibly be looking for a backup center at the agency. So guys, we're smaller as of right now. As of 11.08 a.m., the Sixers are a smaller team than they were prior to the draft. So yes, they do need some size. When you go get Seth Curry 6'1", Danny Green is really more 6'5", and he's not who he was anymore, so let's not even think of him as this tall, elite wing defender, because he's not. He used to be at some point in his career, but not anymore. You're small. We're small. So we need to bulk up a little bit. It, it went to two extremes. We were too big, and now we kind of need a little bit, but guess what? Dale Moy is smart. Dale Moy can balance out the roster. I'm just saying, don't let last year be something where fans now are just against any type of size. We needed a backup thing there. Just use the draft pick on it, like Paul Reed and... Uh, okay, we'll, we'll get to the other draft picks. But I'm just saying that getting Seth Curry was good for off-the-bench purposes or if he starts. My whole thing was he has an extra year on his deal. If your plan is 2022, that extra year kind of gets in the way of that. But I'm, I'm slimming down on it because in Del Moy we trust. If Del Moy needs to move that extra year of salary at some point, probably next offseason, he will be more than capable of doing that. But it's just the fact that that extra year gets in your way if 2022 Harden is your end game goal, his extra year gets in the way of that. And if that is the true main focus, I wouldn't have minded just keeping Richardson because he would have declined the player option, he would have been a free agent. If Gordon Hayward declined a 34 million option, of course Josh is going to decline an 11 million option. So basically you trade an expiring contract for a three year deal. And if that third year, if, if Seth Curry had two years basically, I would have been as ecstatic as everyone else. I'm just concerned about that 30 year because Seth Curry to not be standing in the way of James Harden. That's all. Or any player. And the unique thing about using cap space, if you can use cap space, and the Nets probably won't have cap space. So really for us, the best case scenario, if Houston wants to hold on to Harden for two years, which would be stupid, fine. Go ahead. He would come to understood the agent and... He doesn't want to go back to you guys. Uh, Houston is handling this the wrong way. Even the Pelicans eventually realized that they had to trade Anthony Davis. And that's why I think that we're assets stocking back up. We're trying to get our assets the way they need to go. Then Moy is an elite GM at this. So in Moy we trust, whether it's now, whether it's the deadline, or whether it's a year, a year and a half from now, the Sixers are looking to replace Jimmy Butler. 
that, that you can basically sum it up like that. The Sixers are looking to replace Jimmy Butler. So, I, I approve of getting a guy like Curry to fit with the team. I was just concerned about that for a year. Okay, let's move on. Isaiah Joe. I mentioned this a little bit earlier in this video, which is getting a hell of a lot longer than people would have expected that you would have thought that I had the tape here. But the reality is I'm actually just running it now because I love the team. I love what we did, and uh, I just have a lot of thoughts about it. So, Isaiah Joe. I am not high on Isaiah Joe. He can't really create his own shot. He's not somebody who's going to come in and, you know, score on the top. His defense is okay. It's solid, but it's nothing to write home about. I think he was drafted where he deserved to be drafted. And I do think that there were other players on the board who could possibly be better. But I will say this positively about Isaiah Joe. He bitch. And he's unlikely to bust. He's just also unlikely to win pass. I'm just not a fan. I think he's a he's a tall guard, so maybe he can contribute to this wing side defense concern that I have, but I just didn't see it. I, I watched his tape literally three or four times. I think he's a spot up shooter. I think he's somebody who can pile it off the bench. Someone said he could maybe be a better fur con. I think he'll be more or less a fur con. It's not a bad thing. Just I, I, I would throw my laptop down if you misgraded the grade and said, Ooh, we promised the run pick a bit number 21. Would have been stupid. So that's really my gist and thought on Isaiah Joe. Solid three, maybe the guy. But don't expect a lot out of him. I I'm not nearly as high as everyone else. I think he was picked exactly where he was picked. I think his limitations are exactly where they are. And that, that isn't the real hype. The real hype is in the 58th pick in the draft. So I'm actually going to devote five more minutes to this. Paul Reed. So I go look this kid up because I really wasn't. Not like I look up every draft pot, right? Like, I looked up Peyton Pritchard. I looked up Eric Hinnon. Well, I believe I actually went to the Mavericks. The Mavericks having themselves a great draft. Mark Cuban. Hey, I see you, Mark. I see what you're doing. I see you trying to build that legacy up with Luka Doncic. I see it. I see it. They had a good draft. So, this Eric... This Reed kid, this Paul Reed kid, I must say Eric Reed, Hall of Famer, safety for the boat. <laughs> he might, hey, Paul Reed might be Hall of Famer for us. But anyway, I go look at this dude's highlights, this dude's clips. How did he fall to 58? The NBA community always says two things. We want to be here who can shoot the ball. We want to be here who can run the floor. We want to be here who can switch on screens. Paul Reed comes, does exactly what every general manager says they want out of a big man, and he falls somehow to 58. This kid has an incredible motor, incredible energy, loves to dunk everything in his path. Basically a bigger, taller Rashawn Holmes, who is so much solid on the defensive end of the floor. I am stoked about it, because Ben Simmons, he needs a couple of things in terms of his teammates. He either needs... Supreme athletes, or obviously his shooters. The Sixers, the Sixers historically have never been able to get him the athletes. I think Joe's a pretty good athlete, so there's that too. I can add that for a plus. Maxley is a good athlete, and Paul Reed is the best athlete out of the bunch. Like he can legitimately get minutes at backup center this year. Paul Reed is that good. Average 15 and 10 and 2.5 box a game. How did the guy get the 58? He should have been a first rounder. Seriously. His attributes, his size, his portfolio, and what he brings, I would have picked him out of that home. The Pistons picked that center. Paul Reed has a better profile, comes from a stronger conference. Like, what are you doing? If you wanted to pick a big man, why not a guy like Reed? But hey, their stupidity is our blessing. Paul Reed at pick 58. There's something to be said about pick BD8. Guess who also picked BD8? Jake Milton. <laughs> the, the 
this was a great first step. It was a great first step. This was a great, a great day one of the condensed, super condensed, but also super awesome. You know, if someone asks RB the question, what do you think? Do you like the longer off season? Do you like the shorter one? I like the shorter one, and if you need to take a time that is not compact with the NFL, etc., and you just find that short window, I like it a lot because the moves happen quickly, and it allows you to really just go after it in a period of time. Do we really think that if this fell off without a time to quote-unquote move things over that they would have made the right decisions that they made? No. So I think this short condensed off season, I think it's really helped people really make a lot of moves in a really productive manner. And it's exciting for the NBA where it's like, okay, the end of the season is over. And they can have a longer off season. Just have the moves happen way sooner. You know, normally the lottery is in June. And then free agency is in July. Screw that. Free agency should happen minimum two to three weeks after the lottery. Or even just a week after the lottery. Like this, this super interest, I think it really does help the league. And I guess you can start the season a little bit sooner. Not as soon as it is now. But maybe instead of a six month layoff, have it be a four month layoff. Start sometime in mid-September or... Just a little bit, even mid-August. I don't know. It depends on when the finals finish. But I do think they're condensing it a little bit. You know, obviously the players want to recover from their injuries, etc. You know, you find a middle ground. But I do think that making it shorter just a little bit will help the NBA get some of these other fans back. Because it just the NBA is drama and we're just getting... Super drama. Do you think we get this drama in a normal off season? Maybe, but not quite this and not quite this fast. So that's what I have for you. This is basically an overview of, well, it turned into an overview of what we did. It turned into the Benny Dot Rivers. It turned into blasting some general managers. <laughs> it was just a really fun video to do. And later on, uh, we're going to show tape of prospects and NBA free agency, baby! Let's go get us some guys!